Next question. Should a foot orthotic be rigid or flexible? And this was a big argument when I was in school. If you were trained in New York, they should be rubber butter. If you were trained in California, they should be made of roador. They should be hard as a rock. The right question is, if I take a curved piece of plastic and I place it on a flat surface, how much vertical force should an orthosis deliver to the human body? That question I can answer. And that's simple first year physics. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. You want me to tell you how much force an orthotic should apply? How about you tell me how much force you're going to apply? What causes the downward force of the human body? First and foremost, it's Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> it's what we weigh, obviously. Secondly, it's how flexible we are. If you're extremely flexible, the ligaments are not helping. Therefore, the orthotic has to apply a greater force to control the foot. If you're very rigid, you're already held in place. The orthotic doesn't have to apply as much force to control the foot. And you do that instinctively. You give your rigid, elderly, arthritic patients softer orthotics than your young, flexible patients, don't you? Third factor, how fast you're moving. And those speed studies are so important. How fast are you moving? Why? Because we know in force plate studies you put more force when running than walking. And as they suggested, they, and I thank you for all this, as they, they so rightly suggested, you need a different orthosis when you're running than walking because you have to apply a different force. So we started a nine-year research project. We started with one engineer at the lab, not me, and now we have six. And we started working with Vanderbilt University's biomedical engineering department. It took us nine years to figure this out, which was digital calibration. And simply, we used Pascal's law. Pressure inside of an enclosed container is equivalent in all directions. So we bled off a pressure transducer, put a digital encoder under the orthotic, began to blow up a bladder inside an enclosed container. It fully contacted the orthotic and then began to move it. Every two thousandths of an inch, we chose that at random, every two thousandths of an inch, we measured the pressure it took to move the orthotic. So we had pressure distance, pressure distance, pressure distance. We had a force curve. The slope of a force curve determines the material's flexibility. We took the slopes of thousands of force curves that worked. Yes, it was a big scatter graph with a couple out here. Those were the warranties. We eliminated them. Then we asked Excel, has a little button called Trendline, and Trendline drew a mathematical formula. Told us the mathematical relationship between pressure and distance and body weight. Now, pressure is not an exact quantity. Force is not an exact quantity. You could walk in different directions. You could step off the curve. You could walk down that path that's winding that Dr. Robel showed us. So what happens? We look at ranges of forces. This would be the, uh, this is, remember this, you learned this in school, Venn diagrams? This is the upward force of the orthotic, just a representative of it. This is the body's downward force. What we're looking for is as much overlap as possible. In other words, can we cover most of, if not all of, the force that the body that can the foot orthotic cover the force the body's putting through it? All of it? No. Because you want the orthotic to move. You want the orthotic to flex. So you want to go just under what the body's putting through it. Otherwise, you'll have an equal and opposite force and no motion. But you get an additional benefit we didn't think about. When you go full contact in the mass position, the foot no longer has to drop down and smash against the orthotic with every step. Because of full contact, you're able to make a very significant reduction in the impact forces. The foot doesn't have to drop down because it's already touching it. So there's no impact. Impact is deceleration as a function of time. You don't have to do it. In addition, 
When you raise the arch that much, people are afraid. They go, wait a second, you're going to cause ankle sprains. Just the opposite we found. We found that when you move the orthotic force to the medial side of the foot, the body's equal and opposite force also moves to the medial side. So what occurs? As you move the force of the orthotic to the medial side of the foot, you decrease inversion ankle sprains. And that's why many of the Major League Soccer Association teams are using this technology. Shear force. When you're in full contact with the plastic, your skin moves as the plastic moves. So what happens? Shear force is reduced. That reduces the amount of blistering you get with foot orthotics. So now you've got an orthotic that doesn't just contact the foot at the end of its postural range of motion, but you have a, an orthotic that contacts the foot throughout the entire gait cycle. And has a tremendous effect, by the way, on what you were just talking about, proprioception. These guys hit the nail right on the head. <laughs> Thank you. So we had to reinvent casting. And how did we do it? We passed weight through the foot in as close to an ideal gait cycle as each individual foot could tolerate with its anatomy. And by the way, I didn't notice that. I was explaining this to a, f a group of physiatrists, and I didn't even know what a physiatrist was. <laughs> and at the end of my talk, they said, you know why your orthotic works? And I said, why? Because you pass weight through the foot and it's close to an ideal gait cycle as people can tolerate with their anatomy. And I said, say that slower so I could write it down. <laughs> this orthotic is going to change something. It's not going to be comfortable the first day because it's going to apply a corrective force. You'll definitely feel it. In fact, if I t push on you, unless you're numb, you're going to feel it. So you expect the patient to put it on and go, whoa, this is different. This is a lot of pressure in my arch. That's a good thing. I look him in the eye and say, you just spent $500. You better feel different or you wasted your money. <laughs> so you have to do a little bit of hand holding with this type of orthosis during the break-in period. You have to explain to the patient, to change something, I have to apply a force. And I, I can't apply a force through thin air. Congratulations. You've just walked down the same path that I walked down. This was my thinking in creating mass posture. Let's see if there's a practical application. We all agree that plantar fasciitis is one of the biggest problems that podiatrists see. And we know that it's due to the amount of tensile stretch, the stress on the plantar fascia. So we know that the plantar fascia stretches and pu is pulled tightly as the foot pronates. Now, here's an interesting study done by Kogler, actually won the ABS Clinical Biomechanics Award in 1995. And what he did was he took different types of foot orthotics, but before he did that, he took a cadaver and he inserted into the plantar fascia a, plantar, a tensile stretch meter. How much stretch is being pulled on the plantar fascia? He tried a low flat prefab. He tried a, a one that was molded to the cadaver. He tried one that was molded to the cadaver in a more supinated posture. He tried an orthotic that was similar to what most podiatrists use. This is similar to what we use in podiatry. This is what I was taught to use. And he tried a UCBL in two other conditions. He tried the barefoot condition and the cadaver in, in the shoe. This was the results. The barefoot cadaver, the cadaver in the shoe, the podiatric type of orthotic, and the, the low flat prefab were identical in the amount of tensile stretch the plantar fascia experienced. But the UCBL was considerably less stress. And the higher you made the orthosis, the less tension or stress was placed on the plantar fascia. They concluded 
Certain types of orthoses are more effective than others in the support of the foot's longitudinal arches. It's suggested that to support the longitudinal arches of the foot effectively, the medial surface contours of the orthosis must stabilize the apical bony structures of the foot's arch. But let's look at the forces. Force coming down the leg. It's divided in two ways, toward the heel and toward the forefoot. Now each one of those forces is applying a horizontal component. Going back toward the heel is a relatively small component. Going toward the forefoot is a large component. It's going to contribute more to the horizontal stretch on the plantar fascia. Now we can look at various axes in relationship to the pull of the plantar fascia, but let's just consider the axis of elevation of the first metatarsal. Now when you have an axis and you drop a perpendicular, you have a distance, the hypotenuse of this triangle is fixed. It's the length of the first metatarsal, forming a particular angle between the first metatarsal and the pull of the fascia. Now if you take that distance, multiply it by the force, you have a moment. What happens as the arch drops? That distance decreases. To do the same amount of work, to apply the same amount of moment, it takes a far greater force on the plantar fascia. That's what I mean, function is posturally dependent. Because it takes more force to change a flat foot than a high arched foot. Now you've all seen these barefoot running shoes. I mean, I see podiatrists blast these things. These are the worst things in the world. But I look at it as an interesting way to look at the foot. If you look at the navicular height in, in a flat foot, and then add the barefoot running shoe, there's absolutely no change. In other words, the barefoot running shoe allows you to pronate to the end of the range of motion. It doesn't help you.